There we go. So today we are pleased to have members from the Drumheller Poverty, Poverty Reduction Alliance here to present uh, information on the living wage movement uh, with an emphasis on considerations and impacts to the local businesses uh, here in our community. And at this time, I'd like to introduce you to two of our presenters today. Uh, we have Scott Gamble here, uh, the Ending Working Project or Poverty Project Coordinator for the Town of Drumheller. That's a mouthful. And we also have Christine Bellingham, Health Promotion Facilitator for Alberta Health Services here. And I have a little bit of bio on each um, Scott's I just whipped together, so bear with me. <laughs> uh, he's been a resident of the Valley for seven years and has a background in community development. And Scott's role with the town is part of a three-year um, project. Um, so we'll learn more about that today. Uh, Christine Bell Bellingham received her Bachelor of Health Sciences in Public Health from the University of Lethbridge in 2019. She is new to the Valley and her position with Alberta Health Services. She is currently working as a health promotion facilitator in, public, in the public health department, as I mentioned. Her service area includes Nihil County, Starline County, Drumheller, and special areas number two. And she also provides support to Prairie Land uh, School Division with comprehensive school health. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Scott and Christine to take the presentation. Thank and you, Heather. Hopefully all has been on. Hopefully. Promises. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so hello. Um, as Heather said, I'm Christine Bellingham, my partner Scott Gamble. We are going to be presenting today on the Living Wage Network. Um, I just wanted to initially say a disclaimer. Um, neither myself nor Scott are content experts in this. And so um, we encourage you if there's any questions or concerns that you may have that we can actually um, answer to please reach out to the Living Wage Network um because they are the content experts here we are just the the little doers okay <laughs> sometimes <laughs> um so the town of drum Heller, along with the, the drum Heller poverty reduction alliance is one of the members of the alberta living wage network which includes 23 members re representing 16 communities across alberta um, the living the network is made up of community organizations and municipalities solely for the idea of creating this living wage movement in Alberta. Uh, the network helps communities calculate their living wage, as well as they help support businesses uh, who are interested in becoming a living wage employer. Okay, so. <laughs> All right, anyways, I have it on here. By the end of the day, <laughs> this presentation, hopefully, you will be able to explain what a living wage is, the difference between a living wage and, or minimum wage and living wage, and how the living wage is calculated, what the benefits are of receiving and paying a living wage, how to go about becoming a certified living wage employer, how and how a living wage factors into drug Heller's overall poverty reduction effort. So brief overview of that. Um, is there anything that you're you burning questions you have that may not fall under those categories that we can see if we'll address along the way? Anything else that jumps to mind? We'll I'll have lots of time for questions at the end as well, but if there's one specific thing. No, all right. And then online as well, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box at your earliest convenience and we'll address them either as we go or at the end as we have time. Okay, first question. What is a living wage? Um, so a living wage is an hourly wage that a worker must pay uh, if working full time to cover their basic needs and be able to participate in their community. Um, so this is based on specific community data, and it kind of un is under the assumption that um, the belief that an individual that is working full time should be able to pay 
all of their basic needs and be able to, you know, live with dignity and participate in their community. So I know Dr. Sarah Newstead is in the building here. Uh, so would you be able to, to read that off, what you told us, why you are interested in becoming a living wage lawyer? Uh, so just for context, yeah, it was called my national historic site. We decided to move up to a base living wage um, in 2023 for all of our employees. Uh, so that's our very lowest employee uh, uh, so the front of house starts at 20, 21 to 20 an hour. Um, and basically, it just the gist is playing, paying the living wage means we are able to contribute to our uh, community exponentially. Um, our employees' salaries, all of our employees live locally. Um, so our employees' salaries feed right back into the value. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. And so I did want to just mention that um, they are in the process of becoming a living wage employer but they are paying a living wage. Okay, so this map shows um, the living wage calculations for communities around the province. Um, you will notice that Drum Miller is kind of in the middle. Um, we're smack dab in the middle, where most of them kind of range between 20 to $22 an hour, where some communities like Canmore are quite high. Uh, but we're in the middle there. So what is the difference between minimum wage and living wage? So minimum wage is the same across the province. Doesn't matter where you live or whether groceries are higher in one area or not. It's just basic minimum and it's legislated by the government. A living wage is more of a... Um, a voluntary commitment to your employees. Um, and so minimum wage is not tied to inflation. Um, we can see that right now that inflation is getting higher. And so we minimum wage hasn't increased in quite a few years. Whereas the living wage, they use data every year to calculate what it would be like to live in each community. Um, minimum wage um, is sometimes often too low to even lift someone out of poverty, where even if they're working full time, whereas a living wage is, is operating under the assumption that if you're working full time, you should be able to be thriving, right, and be able to pay all of your bills, and you should earn enough to make and meet and participate in your community. Quick, um, I'll take over the calculation side of things. How many people are numbers people, math people here? Who likes to, yeah, you're here for the number crunching. All right, got a few. Okay, I'll spend some time here. Uh, so a couple of big points. The numbers, as Christine said, are, are local. We did as much of the calculation by calling businesses, finding out how much it costs to live here. Um, we got daycare rates from all of our local providers. We've got called Century 21 for their market rental rate, um, gas prices from our local gas stations for the year, for the food budget. Um, AHS has participated in the National Nutritious Food Basket Survey. So in September, uh, nutritionists across Alberta went around to grocery stores and priced out in our grocery stores in town how much a certain standard basket of goods is, and that's what we've based um, our food costs on. So it's taking into consideration exactly the context that we live in. So as much as possible, everything is drumheller on the ground specific, um, or things like utility rates where we're able to kind of get that didn't have to research it on the ground, but that's available data for us. So it is very reflective of this place and here and now. Um, also, it includes net income. If you're wondering, is this gross net? What does it all include? It includes absolutely everything. We have considered all of the factors and how they interplay. So things like the Canada Child Subsidy, um, any sort of grants or subsidies you might get, tax breaks, uh, the newly minted uh, Alberta Affordability Grant will come into next year's living wage calculation. Um, so all of those things are calculated in for two reasons. One, we want it to be an accurate picture, right? 
And two, um, it's helpful for, uh, as a research piece, as an advocacy piece to say, well, how does different policy, different grants and subsidies impact kind of this bottom uh, sector of, of employees? And so we, yeah, it's not, not all geared towards just businesses, but also, yeah, it's an advocacy piece going up as well, too. And then lastly, uh, it's realistic, we, we think. Um, we have gone through, like I said, and itemized all the different categories that a regular person would have to spend. So food, clothing, footwear, housing, which includes your rent, utilities, insurance, their transportation costs. So both maintenance for a basic run-of-the-mill vehicle and uh, fuel and gas costs, um, childcare for the categories that applies. We'll get into that in the next slide. Uh, and then healthcare, if you're not receiving benefits, paying for Blue Cross for yourself uh, and your family. And then there's one big lump sum category that looks like a big number, uh, but is covers everything else basically, right? So from your cell phone and internet to your household goods, health and fitness things, personal care and hygiene, any sort of leisure, entertainment, Christmas gifts, birthday presents, everything has to fall into this one last category. Um, and then there's also a contingency fund. Um, I guess it's not the last category. Uh, the third last category, contingency fund is so a two week um, pay uh, block for sickness, bereavement, family emergencies, thing like that. Some people should have a little bit of a buffer. Two weeks is a pretty small one. Uh, and then also uh, part of the dignity piece is that people should be able to work to get ahead. Um, and so we include tuition for one distance ed university class per semester. So two for the year. So those are, from what I've heard from people, most people agree that's a pretty modest, basic, reasonable um, standard of living from what we've calculated. Uh, another math methodology piece, uh, in previous years, the way we've calculated it was based on one standard family. So a family of four, two adults, both working full-time in the household, and then two kids, one full-time in school, one uh, in childcare full-time. Uh, and the shift in most of the living wage movement has been towards three different households and then uh, doing a weighted average of that. So that's what we moved to this year. So there's a shift in, if you knew what our number was last year and what it is this year all across the province, it's kind of been a bit wonky because we are changing methodology, but we're hoping to standardize that. Uh, and we work with other living wage movements across Canada to try and kind of be within the same boundary. So it's, you're comparing apples to apples as much as possible. So there are different household sizes are a two parent family, uh, where like as before, two parents, two children, both adults working full time. Uh, a lone parent with a young child in school full time, and then a single individual working alone. So we can make all the calculations for what that costs. So the single individual doesn't have to pay for childcare, but then they're also not receiving the uh, Canada Child Grant. Um, and so factors in differently. And then we take uh, a weighted average. So we look at the census data for Drumheller and say, how many of each of these households do we have here? And then average it based on those numbers and end up with one single number. We go with one single rather than having three different ones. And based on, you know, what situation your employee is in, you could pay that much. It says it's simpler, one, just easier. The numbers are all quite close. It's not a hugely wide disparate um, spread in the wages. Um, and it should, yeah, a dignified amount of, of uh, income is kind of the same regardless of your, your life situation. It's, it's just a, an average portrayal anyways. We're not trying to be specific to each individual's needs and scenario. Okay, so who benefits from employers becoming living wage um, employers? Um, Obviously, the, your employees would benefit, right? Um, it gives them more freedom to nurture their personal, professional, and community relationships. Um, they're able to spend more money, more time with their loved ones, um, be able to contribute to volunteerism. If they're not working two jobs um, a day just to get by, then they have more time to actually participate and help out. Um, it also contributes to better mental and physical health. Um, instead of worrying about, oh, how am I going to pay my rent? How am I going to buy food for my child? They're thinking, okay, those costs are covered. Now what? Now what can I think about? How can I contribute to my community? So they are physically, mentally, and personally healthier.
We mentioned that it does help the community, not just with them participating, but when the lower income, um, Goldman Sachs found in a study that when you increase the wages of the lowest income people, that money actually goes back into the local economy. Whereas opposed to if you're giving more money to the higher income earners in the community, they're planning trips to the US, to the to Europe, and other local in other uh, economies. So that money isn't going back into local, it's actually going elsewhere. Um, it also can help build and sustain a vibrant community. So workplaces are what attracts people to drum power. And a lot of times, if they can, they would love to stay here. So it is building that community up. Um, and lastly, it alleviates the fin financial cost of poverty. In Alberta alone, poverty approximately was $7.1 to $9.5 billion a year, just due to healthcare costs and also uh, the judicial system, um, and also uh, loss of taxable people, right? Okay, so we have another component. <laughs> Um, I think at this time, we're just going to ask whether there any questions or anything that we need to clarify so far. Are you guys all with us? You're awake. We have anything on the chat. That's my yeah, do we have anything on the chat? No, we don't. Okay. okay. Um, but it's not just the community and employee side. Uh, it's also for employers as well. Oh, I should have mentioned with the methodology uh, slides before. The numbers are available. If you want to see what's been calculated, um, that's available on the Alberta Living Wage Network website. So they have a breakdown for each community, what the costs are for each of the different, different households. Um, and I can have conversations about that as well, too. Just didn't, I know we like numbers, but not everybody does. So we'll preserve the people whose eyes have glazed over. Uh, but so uh, who else benefits? Employers do. Um, so how? Um, it signals your corporate social responsibility. That's increasingly a thing that matters for customers these days. They want the businesses they shop at to share the values that they have and to demonstrate it. Lip service isn't good enough. So this is a concrete example of saying, yes, believe in equity for all segments of society. Here's how we're proving it through this action. Um, Competitive advantage in the job market, you will be an employer of choice for people, um, both for the social equity reason, like, oh, I share those guys, I also want to work for that company, and then also might be paying more than other places competing for jobs. We know the labor market is scarce. I saw the latest labor force numbers that came out this week, and we it's going to be tough this summer finding people. So um, this is a potential leg up in that category. Um, it does reduce business costs, um, surprisingly, um, so that you, there's turnover costs, turnover training, lost productivity, um, statistics, research says that employees that are paid a living wage stay with companies longer, they have better job satisfaction, they are more productive, and so, yeah, turnover costs alone, we'll get into a specific example of that from one study right away. Um, and variable costs as well too, right? So uh, absenteeism, when employees are stressed, when they are ill, when they're working multiple jobs, they aren't able to be available mentally, physically, uh, emotionally um, at your work, at workplaces as readily as if they know that their basic needs are met. Um, Stress-related work impact, I think that speaks for itself. And employee morale, right? That employees feel uh, work pride and loyalty, which in turn translates to motivation to work harder. You, you may be paying a living wage already, but some of that certification piece too can mean like that people know that it's you've committed to it. You have, um, have their ongoing interests in mind as well. Uh, so yeah, so some more good numbers. So this is 90% of living wage employers, the, and this part of the sentence, have uh, found benefit. Only 3% of employers said there's no benefit in being a living wage employer. So some of those benefits are good publicity, staff morale, helped us live our values, staff recruiting, lower staff turnover, increased pro uh, productivity. Uh, and then the couple of quick 
stats from the UK. Um, where they, yeah, they, they've been in a part that had the living wage movement bustling along for a lot longer than we have. And so with stats from the UK, 70% of employers stated that they absorbed the cost of the living wage without making major changes. And that 50% of surveyed employers reported that the living wage had improved both recruitment and retention, uh, while nearly half of 45% reported that accreditation had improved the quality of applicants for living wage jobs. So I think those are significant statistics, um, real life examples for, for all of us. So this is slightly confusing. I'll try and explain it simply and easily. So this is from a Harvard Business Review study. Uh, it's comparing Costco and Sam's Club Walmart in the US. And so Costco tries to be an employer of choice. They pay in this study uh, $17 an hour, 82% uh, of their health care premiums are covered. Uh, they have a great retirement package compared to Walmart, Sam's Club, not nearly as good. Uh, and what Harvard Business Review's calculated uh, that first of all, just like bare statistics that, that turnover rates were far less, 17%. Uh, in Costco, and then after the first year, once you've retained an employee for one year, uh, retention rates uh, dropped to 6%, or yes, no, turnover rates, retention's 94%. For Walmart, though, on the other hand, paying less, less quality workplace, 44% uh, turnover rates in a year. And Harvard Business Review's calculation is that Sam's Club uh, is losing $612 million because of those turnover retention rates, and Costco is losing $244 million. A uh, pretty significant jump between the two of them. I, I hope that all of you can afford to lose that much money. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the the, uh, the overall what principle remains the same, right? The retention and job satisfaction is huge when you make this commitment. Okay, yeah, Mike. Um, as you can see that. Uh, the living becoming a living wage employer uh, is representing all sorts of different sectors. Um, we are happy to announce that we have almost two in our um, community. Happy Dinos Play Care is one of them, and the Alex Coal Mine will be the second one in in a little bit. Um, so yeah, any sector uh, from construction, consulting, service providers, um, cleaning. Um, there's, uh, there's always room for whatever sector you're in. Um, so we did get a quote from Happy Dinos Playcare. And so they just say that they understand that early childhood educa educators are the foundation of our child care center. Our caregivers need to be supported with a living wage in order to provide the best possible care to our children. Higher wages also improve employee longevity, and that consistency is beneficial to everyone. I was combing through the list of employ employers on the Alberta network yesterday as I was preparing, and I think Happy Dinos is the only uh, daycare, childcare center and the, uh, certified in the Alberta network. So some sectors, it's Harder than others, there's lots of architecture and engineering firms that are living wage employers, and it's like, yeah, not that impressive. Uh, <laughs> so, so some some industries it's harder than others, and childcare is one of them. Childcare is traditionally like low wage workers, and so I kudos to Krista who just started in the past year opening to Happy Di Happy Dinos, um, and I think you said as well, Sarah, that yeah, if we can do it, anybody can, right? Also. Uh, Depend not depend on low pay, but like that traditionally not a high income job. So, so we're gonna get into some of the nitty gritty on if you wanted to become a living wage employer, how would you go about doing that? So just the super high level basic. It's an online application form. You can just go on, check it out, see what's there. If you uh, aren't currently paying a living wage or don't think that you are, there's an implementation plan. How are you gonna get there? What are you gonna do? If you know that you're already there, we pay our employees $100,000 a year, check, you're good. Um, but yes, uh, if that process is onerous at all, uh, our director, Ryan McCannellow, after uh, in Edmonton, He's fantastic. He works with all of the businesses. 
looking at certification and crunches numbers, works through the scenarios of, you know, different ways you could go about being creative to, to do that. Then we'll talk a little bit about that as well, too. There's some flexibility. It's not all about just this number. There's other things that factor into it. Um, so then you go through the process, you sign a license agreement, you and the network, um, either party can cancel at any time saying, you know what, it's not working for us. Uh, you notify your employees and everyone else. You can put signs up in your windows, put it on your website, announce it to the world. Um, and then you don't pay your annual membership fee. Uh, it gets waived for the first year of being part of the network. It's a nominal fee. It's um, prorated for how many employees you have. Uh, I think, and it's, there's a rate for private and a rate for public um, nonprofit. And it's, I think, $50 is the bottom end. And I think if you have like a private company of 500 employees or more, I think it gets up to a thousand. So it's most of them range in the low hundreds of dollars. It's pretty nominal. And it goes towards paying our employee, uh, Ryan, a living wage um, and supporting uh, advertising, marketing, the research itself um, to make the network run. And we also, as members of the living wage network, pay far more than you will pay. So. <laughs> um, yeah, some, some more, few more specifics, uh, things that kind of go into the calculation that you may not consider. So it's not just direct employees, also employees of contractors, but not also every contractor. So things like your cleaners, your maintenance people, stuff that are full-time doing significant regular work also factor into that. You don't have to rip up your contracts and sign new ones when you get certified. You can wait until the contracts expire, but then when you sign new contracts, then you have to include that clause saying, you will pay your employees a living wage as part of that. And it's uh, yeah, it, um, nice to feel like you're passing that along as well, that the benefits don't just stop at your borders of a business. Um, there is provision for interns, trainees, co-op and practical placements there that you don't have to pay a living wage for those things, provided uh, they don't take up too much of your workforce. It's not meant to be a, a workaround where you can just call everybody an in intern and not pay them well. So we encourage you to uh, pay still as much as you're able for of, of a living wage to all your employees. Uh, and then every year, like you said, we recalculate with the living wages. Every year you get the opportunity to kind of revisit it, see if you're still on par, see if it still works for you, adjust whatever you can and opt out if you need to, if that's not gonna work uh, at any given moment. So, and it doesn't always go up either. Uh, Canmore and Medicine Hat actually decreased this past year in their living wage. So they, which is also another part of the advocacy piece, Canmore, um, is 3270, I think, and it was 36 the year before. And it's because they know that their living wage is horrifically high. And so they have worked with business partners, with community members, agencies, with the government to find affordability uh, things that they can do to bring down the cost of living for people. And so they've been able to do that. And it is reflected in their living wage, which is fantastic. And same thing with Medicine Hats, working really hard on housing strategies and things like that. So um, yeah, and so the other thing is we want to, we recognize that you're already doing a ton to support and encourage and um, celebrate your employees, that it's not just all about the dollar value per hour. Um, you do so many things to care for your employees and make sure that they're doing well. And so we recognize that and take that into consideration uh, in the calculation. So if you pay benefits, if you have holiday or paid days off above the legislated minimum, if you offer things like a gym membership or meals or food or further education, lots, anything, that falls within the living wage calculation. If you offer something that offsets that, then we have calculate that as part of their wage and then would effectively lower the dollar per hour wage that you would need to pay your employees to become a certified living wage employer. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. I think that's a pretty misconception is you have to ask the dollar amount. It's, oh, yeah. Yeah, if you're not paying 2120, then you're out. There's, yeah, there's absolutely recognized that there's lots of costs that go into having employees. Um, and we want to recognize them and appreciate them and work with you, be creative about it. So I have a couple of examples. What are we, how are we at for time? Okay. 
So a couple of examples. So let's say you're an employer, you're paying $19 an hour, and you include benefits as part of your job. So mid-level, 100% employer premium paid, um, and nothing else though. So what would you, your functional compensation be? 2017. So be like you're paying your employees 2017 an hour. So you're not yet quite there. How much would you need to bump up by? The anticipation. <laughs> So your base pay would need to be $20.06 an hour. So you're jumping up a dollar six in your wage that you're paying. So something to think about. And we have another example um, that is, and then we can check and if you, see if you have questions on that. So do you want to, yeah, go ahead now. So, so uh, is, that, is that something that an employer can calculate on their own? Like, do you, do you have formulas and numbers? It's, and... It's, it's not a user-friendly calculator that we have. So we would say, contact Ryan. Yeah, um, I have some access to that. But yeah. yeah, yeah. But he does lots of that and saying, okay, if you go and say, this is what we, we like to see where we're at even. Yeah, These are the yeah. things we offer. Or how close are we? Then contact the Living Wage Network. We have contact information at the end. And they would love to work with you on that. And, and, and it is a process, right? It's... We, there's lots of employers that come and say, how are we doing? Okay, let's, we'll take a year and figure out, you know, what things can we add along the way? Where can we communicate with our employees and see what would make a difference for them as well too. It's not, sometimes it's, it's not necessarily about the calculation, but functionally, how does it work for them, right? And the next example, uh, we're going to look at uh, if you offered university tuition, that two credits per year or two classes per year, that might not be useful for your employees, right? But so let's look at this one. So yeah, you're not paying benefits. So you're working in the food service industry and you supply one free meal per shift, paying for university, one uh, course per semester, and you're offering lots of days off. Five, six days, three personal days, you're paying the stat pay for all the optional holidays, uh, functional compensation 22 to 14. So you're over the, the living wage already, starting at that same $19 an hour. Which I was, our, I just got these numbers in this morning from, from Ryan. And I was like, whoa, really? Wow. It was surprising to me. Um, and it, it just out of curiosity, if you wanna know what, how low you could go or <laughs> would be, oh, not that we'd recommend reducing your wages because of your language calculation, not what we're trying, but if you're, yeah, we're, if we're paying minimum wage now. Maybe what do we need to come up to? Maybe 1794 would be that base rate. So there's lots of flexibility, right? You think about all the things that go into the calculation, transportation, uh, yeah, groceries, housing, uh, yeah, everything you need to live. Is there a way that as part of your business that won't cost you very much or nothing at all to offer that to your employees and reduce their cost of living? Right, add it in. Let's see what we can do. Right. So uh there, yes. Yeah, what that base is 1794 is that would that calculation have benefits to the analysis? So that's the so that's the so like if you were if you started at nineteen dollars an hour oh, and had exactly all this, you would end up at is your functional compensation is 2020. 22, 14, but as you started at $15 an hour, you need to bump up and you'd have to go to 1794 to reach that 2120. Yeah. And just to say, uh, to Ryan, with our education network, that is a core function of job, right? It's to support employers to figure out where they're at right now, what they would need to do, and all of that. So don't feel like you're putting out like that's a job. Yeah. <laughs> he genuinely likes doing it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's also a number. He's a number. Yeah. yeah. I'll pause here actually before we jump on. We're getting to the end. Is there more questions on the nitty gritty of it? Um, I'll leave time for more questions at the end as well, but just. All right, um, so yeah, the last portion, it's really, it's not just about how much employers pay employees, right? That's what gets the focus. That's what I spent most of my time talking about today, but really it's about, it is a living wage movement. It's about changing how we consider what we should pay people. Do we pay people based on just what's been the industry standard? What does our business model dictate? Um, what is the minimum wage? And we just base it on that. Or do we start at what do people need to live? What's a basic standard of living? Recognize that it changes drastically based on where you live. And a consideration that yeah, if somebody's working full time for the full year, they should probably be able to get by in life. 
Um, and it seems like a reasonable proposition from my perspective. And I know, yeah, I, I have talked to lots of people that they've kind of been struck to the heart and surprised by like, oh, I never considered that that wasn't um, how my people were living. And I know I've talked to so many uh, business owners and employers that want to do right by their people. And, and it's hard. It is tough. We recognize that businesses small businesses, local businesses have struggles and are struggling and margins are small. And so we're not trying to lay a burden on anyone in particular. And so this is also, like we said, an advocacy piece. This is for you as well to say, look, this is the cost of living. Some of this is the cost of doing business for you, right? And you also have to live in, within these means. Uh, and so it's uh, an accurate point in time reflection of how much it costs to live in any given place. Um, so you can use it as a tool um, in comparison to other communities as well and say, what do we need to do as an industry to change? Uh, and then uh, poverty awareness as well too, right? How many people in our community are struggling to get by? And we know it's a lot and this kind of gives, but what is a lot? If you put a number to it, then we have data. We know we can, we can move the needle. We can make change. What you can measure, you can change. And so this is just a measurement tool. And the living wage doesn't have to be the thing that moves the needle, but it's one way to see where we're at so on the dial. Um, and then also, um, it's part of the larger poverty movement as well, poverty reduction movement. And so that's my position at the town. I am part of an ending working poverty project, which is a town of Drumheller's partnership with Tamarack Institute. And they do poverty reduction work, community development across Canada. And so they're offering coaching. They're offering kind of leadership and guidance on how we can reduce working poverty by 5% over three years. How can we measure it, benchmark it to know that we're succeeding? Um, and then supplying funding for initiatives for things that are gonna target specifically, what do people need? So I can come here and say, as employers, as business owners, what do you need? Do you need help? You know, bringing those people in that you'd like to pay more, um, but these are the barriers to doing that. How can we help? How can you partner with us um, to figure out how to help everybody so that everyone is, is doing well in our community? And that's one of the things, reasons I took the job. One of the reasons I'm excited to do the job is because I, I know people in Drumheller care about their community. They care about the people who live here. Those of you who have lived here for generations, you know all the people that do well and all the people that may not. And, uh, and know you have a genuine heart for making sure that Drumheller as a whole is doing well. And I think as our tourism sector especially uh, hopefully booms and it's just growing, um, people around the world are looking here as well too. I think it would be an excellent opportunity for us to say, how can we do right by all people as more and more people come to see us and be uh, maybe a beacon, maybe some point of recognition that, wow, they're really doing it right. Um, so I think we have a phenomenal opportunity to be leaders in that. So um, yeah, so if you want to be a part of the larger movement, not just living wage, if that's not going to work or not a thing that you can uh, even have control over. Maybe you're just here for interest sake, whoever's online. Um, come join the Poverty Reduction Alliance. We meet once a month. We are planning those initiatives. We're looking at the research. We're looking at the deep underlying causes of poverty. Poverty is super complex. complex. It's not just a do the one thing and it's all fixed. Just pay everyone a living wage and everything will be fine. No, that's not the case. It is a complex thing. And so we need help with big brains, uh, able hands and bodies to come and participate. All right, I think that's all I have. We do have a question online. Oh, um, Becky says, what is being done about the housing shortage in our community? Nothing, we're not doing anything. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, that, absolutely. That's a huge one, right? Like. Great, pay someone a living, pay someone double the living wage, but if there's no place for them to live, who cares how much they're getting paid because they can't find a place. Uh, so the town of Drumheller has the housing strategy ongoing. Uh, the next phase, the recommendations and strategies, I think are close to ready to launch and they have step-by-step, step, this is how we're gonna do it. And once again, complex problems, not a snap your finger, solve the thing overnight, but little by little, and with the support and encouragement of all of you, um, those things get done. So there was a just 
on that. Sorry, you can't see me, but there was a presentation to council on camera, so it is filmed. You can see it on uh, the Town of Drum Palace YouTube, um, not from Monday gone, but from the Monday before. They gave an overview of um, the results to date from the housing company, some of the actions that have been recommended. It's not the full thing, because you know you only had you know, 20 minutes, and then it's a full report, um, but uh, it kind of explained next steps as well. So if you are particularly interested in that, I would encourage you to watch that on YouTube. And five minutes of your time. Um, and if you have further questions, I can give you at the end details of Reg, who Reg Johnson is our non-development manager and he's running that project. We would happily give you an update as well. Because yeah, we recognize that the housing crisis is absolutely one of the key features of from right now in yeah. um, many communities. Absolutely. Yeah, question. My question was about how do you become a living wage supporter if, if it's a seasonal thing? Like right now, we hire a lot of people. And we always have a large gap during the summer. And then, you know, somebody who's worked full time, full more during the summer, come October, they're probably working 24 hours a week instead of 40. Well, that's a huge impact regardless of working and living wage or not. So, does that factor into your, your uh, living wage? So, for the certification okay. process, it doesn't. Like, we're not, because okay. some people don't want to or don't see it. the bonus field, for example. May till October, right? Yeah, absolutely. So be, okay. Yeah, so the certification okay. process doesn't matter, um, but it is a thing that we're considering because we know it has a big impact on poverty and drug color is the seasonality of work. All of a sudden, there's lots of jobs. All of a sudden, there's none. And so, yeah, I'm curious to see, to do some research and talk to partners to see, you know, what's the best way of doing that big Yeah. But if, yeah, is it, can we know, does, does someone know how, what's the best way to go about doing that when you know you're going to swing wildly? Around this? There's some part of it which if all of a sudden you're, you get certified and you get everybody after that living wage, do you lose certification because all of a sudden you're working 24 hours? No, that's, yeah. That was a good question. Not for, no, I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. That's wonderful. It's not, it's not full time. You don't have to have all no. full time employees. No, yeah. The, the calculation is based on full-time hours, but the diversity of how many hours any employee works is too difficult to calculate, right? Yeah, thank you. Other questions? Yeah. So with some business owners, they're probably struggling to act with the minimum wage right now. Yeah. And, and the challenge with any of this is it's a cycle, right? So you increase wages, that adds to inflation, that adds to prices, which then adds. So it's not a... It's not a simple solution like we presented it, right? And, and even in your Walmart example, because, I mean, I just crunched the map. You said they lost a bunch of um, people for, for time, but the actual cost they would have incurred to go from seven or $10 to $17 was a billion dollars. So, mm -hmm. and that would have had an impact on their price. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's simplistic on some of the assumptions. That we, that we perform, I guess, on that. Somewhat. The inflation piece, like there's been lots of research done. Uh, so like with minimum wage increases, so there was a study done, I believe it was Seattle, um, bumped, or California bumped its minimum wage. And so researchers were looking at Seattle to see what would this uh, impact would it have on inflation and prices of goods. And there was nothing worth mentioning, right? And there's other studies similar. Uh, there's... It, so it's also not necessarily one to one the other way too. It, it impacts it absolutely, but it's not. Yeah, it's. It depends who does the study and what they want to find out. You have to <laughs> on any of those types of things to the real life, and then there's um, whatever studies. Yeah, yeah, and you're each. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the so the Living Wage Network website is a wealth of resources. Um, we have their websites and contact information up. Go there, they answer lots of questions like that or kind of the concept of like, well, most kids earning a living wage are kids. They're living at home or earning the minimum wage. What do they need um, to earn 21, 24? There's statistics on who's earning minimum wage, what the percentage of people are, uh, what sort of get out of the way. So um, lots of great questions. Um, on there, please contact me anytime, call me, shoot me an email. Um, I'm happy to sit down and crunch numbers as much as I'm able, or yeah, it, 
whatever you like just to talk. If you want to join the Poverty Reduction Alliance, come join us, um, or just want to participate in some way. Oh, how do you do that? Uh, we meet once a month. We just met yesterday. Um, we you put your name and email down. down. Yeah, we'd love to have as many join as possible. Who is the wage in Alberta? So this network, so the Alberta Living Wage Network. But who is the network? Oh, so the network is there. So it's municipalities, not all of them, but like a large yeah. portion. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So who started? It was actually a subcommittee. It formed out of the Alberta Poverty Reduction Alliance. Which again is made up of numerous municipalities across the province, as well as agencies and organizations such as and poverty Edmonton and well, many agencies. Um, and so one of the things it was like an action item that came out of it is what can we focus on? And given that across Canada, 40% of people that are in poverty are working. And it, one of the things they said we should look at is working poverty. And so one of one of the things you can look at as part of working poverty is living wage. And so they established the living wage network. And they, as you said, in order to be a member of the living wage network, get them should be. Um, and that supports them calculating the cost of the living wage. Prior to that being a network, communities were calculating their own and they were using their own methodology and they were each paying a consultant to help them with it. And then the calculation of benefits is actually very complex, right? It's, it's pretty nuanced um, calculations. And so by bringing everyone together, we paid one consultant to, to figure all of that out and create a tool that could be used by all. Um, and, and it also harmonized methodology and the process across the province um, and ensure that there was some consistency in that sense so that we can kind of look to community to community in some ways as well. Um, so that's kind of how it was created in the first place. And um, just on the advocacy piece as well, because that is a really important piece of this. We calculated our living wage for drum color in 2019, sorry, in 2020 and in 2021, and now 2022, so three years to this process. And our living wage did drop from 2020 um, to 2021. And the reason it changed was because of an introduction of changes to childcare provision. That, that's what made the difference. Um, and so it, it, it can be used to advocate on those pieces to other orders of government to um, make changes that impact drastically at the grassroots level in each of our communities, as well as you know, the work that FOIA did in this process as well. Or Did that answer your question? Yeah. How much chat more? You need to. Yeah. Well, and I really like this idea of, of one of the goals of the living wage network is to actually bring the cost of living down forever. Right. Yeah. Like yeah. that's the goal, not to bring the cost of living up, to actually to advocate and make sure that we're putting in some sort of support network that, and, and advocacy that can actually bring the cost of living down for everyone. Because yeah. we have to all admit the cost of living down for everyone. Right. One of the big things that shocked Brian as we sat with him and did the calculation was when we did um, utility costs. And he was he's in Edmonton, right? They don't have transmission distribution fees. He was like, How do you know? I was like, tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the pieces that is being actually advocated on now is the distribution fees. So because if they would change it, that would make a massive difference to everyone's distribution, right? So yeah. It's also about the people that are just at that are talking about poverty. It's the cost because they pay there is a fun deal that they're depending on their code from that to the kind of guarantee. But I'm also talking about like the minimum wage. What you talked about isn't just money. Yes. Yeah. Maybe you can ask, you know, maybe employees can give people extra days off for their vacation. Yeah, your thing. Paid time off is really the gateway if you don't have the money um, in, your, in your business plan to actually. Flexibility in your business plan to actually pay that way. So your paid time off is a really, really easy way to sort of bump, bump your overall compensation. And I think it's also a helpful tool to just have conversations as well, too, right? If you want, what would make a difference? Right. We'd yeah. like to help out. What would it, what for you concretely? I can make all the guesses, but you as employee, what would help you? And if yeah, you know what? If I had some sick days. That would change so much. That's a huge impact for like my wife and I. Um, yeah, makes all the difference in the world some days. So just asking, what 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 can I do to help? So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. You got any other?
Um, is there is nobody in the chat box? Um, you don't. Yeah. So we are good. Stop sharing the screen. Let me see who's online. I don't want to do ask those questions. So um, thank you both Christine and Scott. A lot of great information, a lot of good questions. Um, I hope you're all a little more educated on this topic. I think um, there are a lot of misconceptions out there about it. There's certainly lots of conversations going on in the community amongst employers, employees, um, and the public in general, I think. So um, hopefully this information today helps to um, put that you know, correct information out there and gives um, us that information uh, to go back and be armed to have those conversations um, with accurate information. So thank you uh, again um, for taking time, both of you, to speak with the group today here in person and online. Um, it's greatly appreciated. And so I'd like to thank you. And just a closing remark uh, about our next chamber event um, is going to be our Women in Business uh, Mentor Roundtable. It's on Tuesday. February 21st from 5 to 7.30 p.m. at the Canals of Cretaceous Conference Center. Registration is uh, required in advance, um, so I'd encourage you to visit our website, drumhellerchamber.com, to check that out for all the details and get signed up if, if that interests you. Um, and uh, in closing, thank you again for your attendance today, and uh, we hope to see you out at our next events or next Lunch and Learn. We are working um, on one for April, because um, February we'll have Women in Business, uh, March we'll have our AGM, and our next Lunch and Learn is planned hopefully for April. Um, something with the RCMP is what we're working on, but it's not finalized yet. So thank you all for your attendance, and I uh, wish you a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye all online. Thank you.